Howdy guys, it's Luke at Geek Gamer Scenix, and in this video, we're gonna build something a little bit ridiculous. I'll catch you after this. This video is sponsored by the Dragon Trappers Lodge. Dragon Trappers Lodge is creating miniatures for you to use for D&D, characters, monsters, to terrain. They also bring out a mobile lodge every month, which is a great centerpiece for all your campaigns in D&D, and is the big motivation behind this video. They all come pre-supported, ready to print, and if you don't have a printer, you can also buy them printed for you as well and shipped to your door. All the links are below. All the models come with their own stat blocks ready to use with Dungeon Dragons 5e. And with this month's Halloween weird world themed, it also includes last year's as an added bonus free of charge. Which is an amazing deal because that's over 100 plus minis included in this month's release. And you get all this for just $15 a month. Check out all the links to the Patreon and everything below. And if you're playing D&D with some power gamers, throw some new monsters at them that they're not used to seeing and they don't know how to deal with. Dragon Trap Lodge has got you covered. Now, as you've seen, Dragon Trap Lodge have an amazing patron. These moving lodges that they do are out of this world. I printed one of these at half the size in resin. And it's still a pretty big model. But I thought, why not, for the sake of this video, get a friend to print it out in FDM. And seem as though I've got a Josh, I'll let him deal with it, putting it together and painting it. And then I can do the fun bit on top. So, let's get it over to Josh. All right, see what you sent me to paint today. Wow. That is absolutely ridiculous. Cheers, Luke. So yes, this snail is absolutely massive. Um, I can see why Luke has sent it to me to assemble and paint. I've never worked on anything this big. And I, to be honest, I've never worked with anything that is being printed in FDM. Uh, which this has. Uh, we printed the head and the tail ourselves in resin, but the rest of it, because of the size of it, we've printed in FDM. So I got started assembling it and a bit of super glue, a bit of activator just to make sure it went off straight away, just to speed up the process. And I was actually fairly impressed with how well this went together. Now, because of the size of it, yeah, there's a few lines where you can see the joins and stuff, but we'll cover them up a, a bit later or do as best to. But because it's been printed in FDM, this actually all fitted together really nicely and fairly flush, considering. That is until we got to the head and the tail. Now, these have been printed in resin. We'd done these on our own printers at work, and I'm not sure if it was something to do with how it had been sliced for FDM, and if it had been changed slightly, but they didn't line up. There was a big gap on the neck, and then there was a big gap on the tail of the model that just really didn't line up. So I needed to do something about that. The other lines that were on the model, you can see them a little bit, but once it's painted and covered up with stuff, these should be fairly minimal. But the one on the head and the tail were fairly bad. And that meant that I'd got a little bit of work to do with some sculpting. To do the sculpting, I'm using Milliput because that is what I had. Now this Milliput had been open for a while in my drawer. It had been wrapped up, but it had been open for a while and I think it had gone a little bit off. Uh, but I did the best that I could with it and covered those gaps as, as best as I could. The gaps on the back of the model, on the shell, the little tiny gaps where the joins were, I just used some UV resin and then cured that. And that more or less hid all of the joins. And like I say, a lot of this is going to be covered up with the stuff that Luke does later on anyway. To prime it, I'm using a rattle can because I did not want to prime this using an airbrush. To paint the slug part of the snail, I wanted to get plenty of different colours on there. So I went a little bit crazy. I added yellow, I added purples, I added different browns to various parts and then started tinting it greens and browns and adding bits in. I wanted to do this because I wanted a lot of variety on the body. I didn't just want it to be green or brown or whatever. I wanted to try and get in those random bits of colour and stuff and just add a little bit of interest to the skin tone. So most of this is sort of underwork that I've done where I've gone in, like I said, added yellows, purples, browns, things like that to get all those interesting colours in. And then I started adding transparents over the top to tint it all to more of a green colour but still with those variations in there. Now this entire process has been fairly 
experimental. I've not really known exactly what I'm doing. I've known what I wanted to get to, but not exactly how to get there. So it's just been a lot of trying things out, trying colors out, and putting stuff in where it worked, changing stuff where it hadn't worked. For the shell, I knew I wanted to have a little bit of a pattern on there. I didn't just want a plain color. So I started from a, a sort of creamy burn color and then added various browns and got darker and darker as I worked my way up, added the recessing and stuff in, used the airbrush for the entire thing because I wanted that nice transition from each color. To help mask that a little bit more as well, I added a wash over the entire thing once I'd finished and that just helped to tie the entire thing together and tint the model so it looked more like what I'd got envisioned in my head. Now that I'd had a little bit of time working on the shell and I'd looked at what I'd done with the body part, I decided I wanted to add a little bit more contrast. It wasn't quite green enough, if that makes sense. So I just took a light green and stippled this on. I wasn't particularly neat or precise with this because I didn't want it to overtake everything that I'd already done. So I stippled this on to add a little bit more variety again on there. And then once that was on, I added about three layers of gloss varnish just to the body part because I wanted that to be nice and glossy because I wanted it to look super, super slimy. For the eyes, I wanted to go with something cool because it's a fantasy model. So I decided to go with a sort of Eye of Sauron uh, inspired look. It's something that I've done before and I really enjoy doing. So I figured why not have a snail that's got eyes like Sauron. I added a couple more details in, like the mushrooms on the side, got them painted up and finished off the eyes. And I'm really, really happy with how it looks. And I'm looking forward to seeing what Luke does with it next. How do, mate? I've That's got all the, right. Yeah, yeah. I've got the snail. <laughs> Snails are small. That's the snail. Snails are small. Well, that one's not. I'm going to put an orc fortress on that. Yeah. It's going to be bigger than anything anybody's ever done. And we're going to get it done in one video, not 20. Yeah, don't call us guy. <laughs> That's ridiculous. So yes, I didn't really know what to expect because the resin one that I printed was still a pretty epic model. Not as epic as this. <laughs> this is a very, very big model. It's actually bigger than my dog. Um, but it weighs an awful lot. The uh, added resin head and tail make a difference because obviously you can see them. Now let's get to being creative and making a big orc fortress like traveling snail squiggeth, whatever you want to call it, for D&D, wargaming and all sorts of different purposes. Now with me not exactly knowing what I was getting, I just went at this blind. I literally got a load of balsa and etched it, ripped it up, and made it fit the best it could. This is one of the best things about doing things for orcs. Rough and ready works really well. And if you've never really done any kit bashing or building any sort of terrain or anything, orcs is a good place to start because you can literally just prefab it together willy nilly and hope for best because it's orcs, it looks cool. Now, as I were doing this, I was using the balsa wood and I was going to use it as the main finish. But what I found was it's a little bit delicate. So what I decided to do was to use the balsa as the frame to the base work. And then we'll add more details to this later. So we can get like all the platforms and everything in place because balsa is very easy to work with and it's in decent sized sheets to cut with. So we level all these out and make loads of platforms, loads of areas for all the orcs and war machines to go. And to add a little bit more strength in areas where there's not enough areas to hold the wood up in place where I need it, we add little bits of dowel rod in just to make it more secure and a lot stronger. And we secure all this in place with super glue. Now using good old coffee steerers, these were about six quid off Amazon, I'll pop them in the links below. I'm not even measuring, I'm not even cutting, I'm just breaking edges off and breaking things to the length that I want and then sticking them down with fast dry basing glue. I actually put a coat of basing glue all over the wooden areas so it remains sticky so I can just put these in place and then we'll 
paint some PVA glue over the top of all of it so it holds it all together and makes it far more durable. The one thing with the coffee stirrers as well is it does make this very, very strong. But not only are we adding detail, we're actually making this so you can actually play D&D and your war games with it if you want to actually house rule some rules for this for what I'm a 40k or fantasy. Now I've been on a bit of a creative block at the moment and just sticking random bits of wood to random bits of wood on this snail really chilled me out and really sort of got me back in the mood for trying new things and doing things. If you've not done this, give something like this a go even if it's just for terrain because I'm telling you the amount of smiles I was getting while I was doing this was unreal. Now for painting it, again I just mask off with a bit of paper, just a bit of black spray paint to do the most of the work for me so I didn't have to go in there and paint pick all the little bits out. Just dry brush some dark brown on there and then after the dark brown I actually highlight with like a, a browny grey and the reason I do this is weathered wood looks very grey. But to tie all that together once it's all done and in place it looks a bit too grey and a little bit too brown so what I do is I get like a brown and black wash and I just wash that all over the wood and that soaks into that and it weathers it and ages it properly and it just all comes together and looks absolutely amazing. All I've got left to do is add some cannons, some crew and some models on top and I've now got a model that I can look at and laugh at and think what the hell am I going to do with this because it's absolutely massive. I'm actually going to take it to a D&D game and we're going to drop it on the table and <laughs> let the guys see if they can deal with it. So thanks to Dra Dragon Trap Lodge for sponsoring this video. It's really got me out of that downward spiral creative block I've got at the moment. And doing something like this has been absolutely amazing and fun to do. And if you haven't done it, try yourself. All the links to Dra Dragon Trap Lodge are below, guys. And if you haven't got a printer, order one printed and sent to your house. Thanks for watching. Thanks for tuning in. And I'll catch you again for the next video. Love, love, love.